I met Carl Begovich in late 2013, early 2014. After hearing his story, it was clearly a case of never judge a book by its cover. Early 1980s, Pittsburgh. He's a dad, three young daughters, fourth grade teacher, basketball coach, recreation director, steel mill economy crashes, there's a teacher strike, he loses his jobs. <laughs> You'll never guess what happens next. We were hurting for money, my family. Things were going bad and I was worried. Guys were always trying to come up to me with different uh, ideas. The, the, all of a sudden, one day they bring in some, co a little bit of cocaine, a little bit of weed. They say, hey, Carl, we got to get into this. This is where the money is. So I said, man, at first I was very leery about it. I was thinking, hey, you go to jail for this stuff. And uh, I didn't have any desire to go to jail, of course. Dante introduces me to this guy at the, at the track. And he starts telling us, he has this, these guys from Florida and he's got all kinds of stuff. We say, yeah, let's, let's see what you got. You know, we figure, hey, just BSing us. I didn't realize he was gonna bring a thousand pounds of weed, uh, 30,000 uh, quaaludes and about five kilos of cocaine. What am I supposed to do with that? We sell it. We sell it? A thousand pounds of weed? 30,000 quaaludes? Yeah. You got a better idea? It's in my house, with my family. My girls are inside. You're not the only one here that needs to make money. What am I supposed to tell my wife? You don't tell your wife anything. I keep everything from my wife. She knows nothing. She came home. She asked me, why is the garage door closed, locked, and you can't open it? I said, I had to disconnect it. And then I explained to her why. I don't know how else to tell you this, mm -hmm. but you know, it's been hard. Yeah. You need some money, right, for the family, feed the kids. I had to pick something up. And I don't know if you're gonna approve of this job. Okay. But there's there's drugs in our garage. What? How do we have a family? What are you talking about? The sample is our main uh, connection for taking our, our drugs up to Pittsburgh at first. That's when we started going strong. We were traveling to Florida a lot. We were having a good time too. Found out I really like cocaine and I found out the best way for me to find out if it was any good was to do it. We did some stuff maybe once in a while we might smack somebody around a little bit. We never did anything too bad. Even though they're, they are bad people, they do have families and kids and stuff like that. There were times there were people who cheated us who did something. Instead of doing something, we wrote it off. My buddy always dressed real nice, with good clothes. Well, Nick the Blade started calling him uh, pretty boy and stuff like that. My buddy doesn't know he's, who he's going outside with. Well, he had a ball knife in his hand with a blade sticking out. He thinks he's getting punched in the chest. He's stabbing him while he's punching him. He almost cuts his heart out of his body. My buddy realizes he's bleeding to death, and he jumps in his car and runs himself to the Monroeville Hospital. And he got, my buddy got visited by two of his baddest guys, and they said, hey, we, we can't protect you. We, don't, uh, we can't guarantee your safety if you talk. And they gave him $10,000, so of course he didn't talk. But anytime we went in any of their bars, we drank for free. Yeah, I was only uh, arrested one time, and that was 1984 when I went on trial in September. But I never got in trouble. I got, I got in trouble because of these guys up here in Tampa. 39 guys were arrested under the RICO laws, which is racketeering law. And out of the 39, 15 of us went on trial here in Tampa. And I was on trial for two and a half months. We told my kids when they came home from school that day that I had been arrested. They started crying. I didn't realize they were going to understand. And now I really felt bad. You know, they started really crying. I'm coming home one day from being processed. My wife and the kids all come running out of the house. The judge acquitted you. The judge acquitted you. I came this close to being in prison for 15 years. Maybe the judges didn't think the case was that good against me. 
I don't know if I gave Vince so much money he paid him off. <laughs> I'm not sure. I really don't know. I, I paid a lot of money. I know that. What, what happened? Uh, we were doing a deal, and he talked me into doing a Coke deal, and I didn't want to do a Coke deal. I was just making good money just doing the weed. But he knew that I got the money from the uh, Irish guys. I had their money there out of town. He figured I, I could use the money, get some a good real price on some cocaine, and bring that back, and we could both make a quick $50,000 from it. I mean, I think there were like 12 kilos. Well, he changed everything on me. We went and we went, went driving, and he, he takes the wheel of my car. And I, he, so he just was a hard guy uh, as far as, he, he wanted to do things his way. And, and I, I usually gave him a little room. And he has me get out of the car. I said, hey, this is what, what we were talking about. He said, yeah, yeah, everything's all right. I got it all lined up. And I'm sitting in there for two hours. He doesn't come back. I know something's wrong. I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. So the, oh, this was bad. This was difficult for me. I went, looked and looked and looked. I called friends of our, both of his and mine. They didn't know, they didn't see him. They didn't know what happened to him. I, we, I went back home to Florida, got a call from the Pennsylvania uh, State Police saying that my car was found burned out in the mountains. And uh, I, like I said, I refrained from asking them if there were any bodies in it or anything. I haven't seen them or heard of anything from about them ever again. I, I got to go call, crawling to the guys that I used their money to make this deal, because I don't have their money. I don't want to go into that. It was a lot of money. Large sum. Large, rather large sum. I'm trying to figure a way to, to pay back those fellows, those Irish guys from Pittsburgh. So, to, so they wouldn't, they wanted to kill me, of course. That's why I was, I went over to the, the Bahamas quite a bit. I hid out in there. My buddy Ronnie, who had the boat, he had a, a place over there. He'd take me over. Then I went over to uh, Costa Rica. My one friend was the uh, uh, owner of a casino. So it, it was good, good places for me to hide out, but it was very, very, got very lonely without my family. I'd come back over to see my wife and the kids because they, they couldn't watch me continuously, you know. I, I got to get out of this. I got to figure a way out of getting out of this so I could be with my, my wife and kids. I'd start wondering, who, who am I? How did I get into the life that I live? We had to come up with a plan eventually to, to give money, get the money for the uh, Irish guys. Because we were in the Bahamas and we, we had this one guy, he's a Bahamian, and he had these uh, bankers who, who did the banking for the, uh, for the casinos. And what they wanted to do, he, they proposed a deal, get counterfeit money and put it in the bank and, and, re, and give, they'd give us real money and they'd make money. I called him Slick Vic. He had, he had connections. He ended up getting the, the, the counterfeit money. There were four of us now. Ronnie brought him in with the boat. Dante was our guy, our muscle guy. If we didn't need anybody hurt badly, we could use Dante. We had to make get the deal going where we would meet with these uh, Bahamians who ran the bank and, and, and switch this counterfeit money with the, the, the real money. The word was that they were gonna make a deal using the money that, that they were going to get out of the bank, get some cocaine. And they were going to buy uh, $4 million worth, but they were only going to get $2 million from us. So that made, gave, made us think, how are they going to do $4 million if they're only getting $2 million? And what about us? We're supposed to have the other $2 million. So right then we started thinking, there's something not, not right here. So we had to think about taking you know, precautions. If they try anything, what can we do? And when it came time to do it, we had the, the, the van. Ronnie rode, drove us into this alley right behind the, uh, the bank. Ronnie stayed back with the, with the uh, van, right? We wanted Dante to be ready if there was any trouble because he was, he was a, bit, a little bit crazy. Well, the, the brothers of this uh, banker, 
They were two big Bahamian dudes. We proceeded to go ahead and uh, go, go into the vault and start exchanging the uh, counterfeit money for the real money. And we finished up with the money in the bank, in the vault. And all of a sudden, these other t the two brothers they had guns on us, and they told us we're not going anywhere and we're not taking any money. I took and I had this bag. And it, it was all of a sudden it started ticking. It, it was ticking away and they were wondering, what's that? And I said, well, we got a bomb here. We figured if you guys pulled something like this, we'd be ready for you. And the one brother, he didn't. He said he didn't believe it. When Vic went in the back, he went, he opened the door and let, let Dante in. We had a gun on them now. Of course, they had guns on us. How are we gonna, how are we gonna settle this? The, the, the older brother that was a, the bank manager, he said, let's just call it an even deal. You take your share and we'll take ours. Now listen, brother. No. You listen. You don't deserve shit after what you pulled. All right? But we're nice guys and we're going to pay you anyway. What are you looking at? Wait, 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 wait. wait. Mm -hmm. You know, my wife and I talk about it. You know, I was a, I was Mr. Clean Cut, All American uh, teacher, uh, like I said, coach, recreation director. I said, well, "How did you feel?" She said, "Scared." <laughs> she was frightened. Uh, they they basically, from what I can tell, to be honest with you, they shut it out of their minds. They they were living good. They all had boys chasing them. They were good looking girls. I felt good that now I'm providing well because the other kids and everybody would talk about how my kids have the best clothes and, you know, and, and live very nice. And I felt, I was proud of that fact. I think I was a good father. They really, they really liked me. You know, I, I escaped going to jail one time. I was lucky. You realize how things can go wrong. <laughs> they go wrong all the time. I, I got, I lost my, nerve I guess or something you know the the will to do it you get tired of it all you know it wears on you you know I had some problems with I had prostate cancer four and a half years ago I was in a bad car accident I was in a hospital for seven weeks and uh, they said a lot of brain damage that's why at times I'm forgetting what the heck I'm saying <laughs> you called me earlier this week with some news do you want to talk about that at all which news was that? Let me think. Well, give me a clue. The, uh, the oh yeah, they uh, just a few days ago, uh, I was going through this this testing, and I went in. And my neur neurosurgeon he told me that I have uh, early stages of Alzheimer's. Carl will call me sometimes to cry my shoulder, as he likes to say. But sometimes he just needs somebody to talk to. And he has family, of course. But a lot of times it feels like his family is embarrassed by him, that they're ashamed of him, ashamed of his past. He did everything he could to support them, and now he feels like a burden. He can't contribute. He will talk about suicide. He'll tell me, if he had a gun, we wouldn't be having this conversation because he would have already killed himself. my wife and my family. They lived a good life. The people up in Pittsburgh, my area, they all knew who I was and what I was. But down here in Florida, now, you know, th these are new people with a lot of them. You know, new relationships. So I don't know. I, I wish I did that. You know, I couldn't do, do anything about it anyway, except apologize to them, and uh, which I probably am going to do somewhere along the line, I don't know when. What, your wife just sent you a text, what's the text? Yeah, can you please stop on your way home and get a gallon of orange juice? <laughs> Things have changed a little bit over the years. Yeah, they, she, she must have done it on my, my, grand, my granddaughter's phone. That's what happens to the big, uh, big time guys. Huh?